Good morning. Good morning. You know, it's it's uh, it's an interesting proposition. We were talking earlier today about uh, what monks had to learn in the beginning, what they did not have to learn in the beginning, and uh, <clears throat> so I'll repeat those things, and then I'll kind of come at them from a different angle. Uh, normally when someone takes Novus Ordination here, uh, I point out to them that uh, in the old days when the Buddha was alive 2,600 years ago, there were three things that he instructed his senior teachers, I guess you'd say. It wasn't, it wasn't quite so organized when he was alive. If the Japanese had gotten a hold of it, you know, they would have had uh, orange belts and purple belts and camel belts and all this kind of stuff. <laughs> And he would just say, well, go find a guy with, you know, at least a brown belt and come back here and then we'll do our thing. Um, but uh, it was that formation, and I didn't, really didn't think about it until the day talking about it a little bit, that uh, uh, because the Buddhist order, religious order of monks and later nuns, was the first religious order that it existed in the world, um, he didn't have anybody to copy. I never, you know, I, I knew that it was the first order, but I never really thought about the fact that he didn't have any kind of template to use. That it was, he was winging it all the way along. And uh, I think it just kept getting more and more complicated. In the very beginning, the monks that were with him, uh, they were co-travelers. And they had spent years wandering in the forest as ascetics. They had started off in the cave with the guru that the Buddha first studied with. So uh, they shared a lot of things in common. They had gone through a lot of things together. And some people could argue the Buddha got lucky and he was the first one to get enlightened. Because these other guys were really ready for it. And we know that, according to the Buddha, when he told them about the Four Noble Truths and the Eightfold Path, one of them was awake. So we're talking almost hours. Buddha becomes enlightened. I know we always, the Buddha gets raised up very high. And in some traditions, the Buddha gets raised up so high, we might as well just call him God, because that's the way they treat him. Uh, to maybe get things in a little bit better perspective, he was God by a couple days. And then this other co-traveler, became awakened, and then at about the end of a week, I'm, trying, I'm not sure if I've got this right, but it was a week or two later, a second one of these, there were five monks that traveled with him, just literally followed him as a senior brother, if you would, uh, students of this guru, and uh, he woke up. So they, they were like the piece of fruit hanging from the tree that was ready to fall at any moment. And we know that within that first year, all five of them were awake, that, uh, that many people came to the Buddha because they recognized that he had something special and um, he had no rules. Now, it, it just went completely the other way. You know, uh, Tom too, last year or the year before, went and spent some time at, was it last year or the year before you were up with one? Year before, yeah. She, she spent some time uh, with some nuns out in Yucca Valley, Theravada nuns. And it was a pretty good experience for her because she got, one, she got to see the other way things are done. Um, and uh, maybe sometimes things were overdone, you know, what she was seeing. But it, it helped her bring things a little more in perspective here. At least something to compare what we do here, too. And uh, she came back with some interesting observations. It got me thinking about what was going on. And by the time the Buddha died, 45 years after his enlightenment, or the other people say 48 years, uh, I've never been able to figure out how they come up with that 48 years, but um, there were so many rules that some of the schools turned into the school of rules. And China had a Venia school, Japan had a Venia school, uh, I think it started up in Korea. I'm reading some more about Korean Zen right now. And I think they started up at uh, 
the, the people that do research on Korean Zen, they keep saying the same thing. The country was so small, they didn't have room for a lot of schools. You know, China was huge, so they could have all these different schools. So they ended up, by the time they got done to present time now, they combined all the schools into one school. Which I think Tianan would have appreciated a great deal because he felt that we needed to stop making separation between us and other schools, uh, just recognizing that they had a slightly different practice than we had, but it was all the same basic stuff. So these early monks, it was, it was almost constant that someone would come and say, my, my favorite that I always use is, Bob was behind the bush with a girl. And, you know, the Buddha said, well, that doesn't look too good. And this is something to pay attention to, is that the Buddha felt, and this has to do with how we perceive our reality, is that what people think is happening is what's happening to them. And it's not a play on words. If people think somebody's doing something bad, like, boy, if we've ever, politically in this country, if we've ever been polarized, we are now. There is no middle ground with this president we have. He's either the worst thing that ever happened to us or he's the best thing. And there is nothing in the middle. I've never heard anybody say, well, you know, he's working pretty hard. He's messed up a little bit, but by golly, I think his intentions, nobody talks like that. He's either Satan or he's the archangel. And it's, it's really a bizarre time to live in because, you know, in a couple of years, we can look back and go, okay, because if nothing else, his presidency will be remembered for the, the, the strength of emotions of people. And the Buddha said, what you perceive is your reality. And your reality causes you to live in the world the way you live in the world. And it doesn't matter whether somebody did something bad. In other words, if I think Obama is, I mean, we still, I still get to hear about he's a Muslim. And I go, oh, okay, we're not over that one yet. Okay, no, because of his name. Now, I'll be honest with you, when he was running for president, simultaneously thinking, boy, this is, this is an extraordinary event to have a black man running for president, I thought to myself, how could anybody with a name like Obama win? Because we were so, you know, we were fighting a war against the great terrorists, against as Obama says, not Islam, but the terrorists within Islam. And I just thought, I, I was so proud of America that they could step beyond names and that prejudice that would almost automatically come up when you hear it. I thought, okay, we have grown. We did something right. Whether you like him or not, we elected him with a name like that. And the Buddha said, yeah, Things like that are our reality. When someone has a name that makes us think that they're a bad person, we don't even give them time to prove they're a good person. We just react to that name. And so here's Bob. Bob was a good monk. And he went behind a bush. For all I know, Bob was gay. And he went behind a bush with a girl, and nothing could possibly happen. But the Buddha said, it's what people think's going on. So you have to be out front. You have to be in the open. Uh, now, you know, the favorite word for governments is we need transparency, which I think is hysterical. I don't think we have anything that's transparent. We just keep pulling more and more back in. And, oh, no, don't watch me because you might see that I'm human, you know, that I make mistakes. So, but that's the catchphrase, isn't it? Maybe it's getting over with, but businesses talk about being transparent and... Uh, City governments talk about being transparent. If it's abuse, then do what you do. If it's not abuse, go feed somebody. How did we get so focused on this one little thing here? Well, the way to do that, he said, you got to be careful. People are going to get focused on the craziest things that don't, that aren't that important. Ultimately, the big stuff's important. So they went along, and of course nobody was punished the first time the rule was broken because there was no rule. So we end up, depending on whose set of rules you go by, uh, the monks have, they always say 250, which I think is interesting, because 
early mathematicians rounding up because it was 248 and the other schools got 227 and they're all the same because they, they double up on the rules and then the women have 200, 350 which is actually only 342 or something and they got all these rules and they all come down to the basic same thing is um, be good just be good Stop suffering. Well, how could rules have to do with suffering? There are more rules about how many bowls you can have. You know, monks in the old days had a begging bowl. So, you know, when you become a monk now, but did, not in the beginning, but now, you become a monk. Well, you have to have you have to have this kind of rope here. I'm I'm shaking my queso, okay. And then you have to uh, have some kind of clothing that goes underneath it. It doesn't matter what tradition you're in, you have to have some sort of clothing so that you're uh, decent. The Buddha was a very decent guy. He, he made all his monks and nuns, they had to take a bath, they had to be clean, they had to keep their clothes in proper order. Uh, if they were dirty, they had to wash them. Uh, he was very conscious of appearance. It took me a long time to realize that's what was going on. Because he kept talking about what people see is what people believe. So here he was wandering around in the forest on a search. And you know, I have no desire to go to India. Eric's been to India at least once, if not many times. And the holy men, they take cow poop and they put it all over their body. And then they don't have to worry about being tempted to get together with girls because what girl would want to get next to a guy with cow poop all over his body, okay? And they smell really, really bad. And the Buddha said, well, we don't want to smell really bad. We, we need to stay clean because the monks were traveling nine months of the year around India and they were teaching the Dharma, uh, the things the Buddha had taught them. So uh, he had to make some rules because he found out that if a monk went into a village and the village was prosperous and maybe a lay person would come out and say, oh, you must be yeah, that Siddhartha guy, you must be his disciple. Why don't you uh, teach us? And so the custom was, after dinner in the evening when it cooled off, they would sit under the big shade tree in the middle of the village and they would teach the teachings of the Buddha, the Buddha Dharma. And uh, so the next day they'd have a nice lunch. Well, typically the monks would, after lunch, they'd take off and start walking to the next village, nine or ten miles away. So we had a rule. The Buddha made a rule because <laughs> always remember that monks are just big kids. And if they come into a poor village and there was they didn't have a lot there, then they would keep walking. They'd look around and go, I don't think there's going to be any good food here. And remember, they took off at sunrise. So they go, we make it to the next village. Because we walk. There's one thing those guys did is they walked. And the Buddhist, somebody came to the Buddha and said, you know, half the villages we go into, we never stop and tell them about your teachings. And the Buddha said, why do you think that is? And he said, well, some of these villages are really poor. So the Buddha said, well, we got a rule. We got to have another rule. From now on, you can only go 10 miles a day. No more than. Well, that was the distance between villages. So then later on, they went into the village and they looked and, you know, you can tell where the wealthy people live, right? Have you seen some of these houses in Apple Valley up on, up on the hill that look like kingdoms? Yeah. Well, if I was a monk, I'd go knock on that door. Probably got some sirloin steak, you know, and baked potatoes and everything they'd be putting. They'd be cooking it right on the grill, putting it in our bowl. So the monks went and they went to the houses of the wealthy. And the Buddha said, okay, now what's going on here? And they said, well, you know, Lord. They called him Lord a lot. Lord, if we go to the poor people, they, they don't have much food. And then, you know, we might be taking food out of their mouth. And he said, well, that's nice. He was sarcastic like me, you know, that's nice. He said, but have you ever thought about, they don't get any merit? These people are very conscious about good and bad karma. And you don't ever give them a chance to feed you. 
You just walk right by them. And you go over to the wealthy people. And they got everything they need. And says, no, you, you have to go to every house in the village. And they went, oh, we get the old rice. They hardly have, they don't even have vegetables in the bowl. And we have another rule. And if you break the rule, then you have to, something happens. You get hit with a small stick. Actually, there's no physical punishment in Buddhism. The worst thing that can happen is you have to go away and you can't come back. But that really is not a punishment. That's the end. And it almost never happens. No matter what bad thing you did, they almost never sent you away forever. But they'd send you into the forest. Remember, tigers live in the forest. They'd send you into the forest and say, okay, go meditate for a week. And then come back and we'll talk about what you did because it wasn't really good what you did. And that was the kind of punishment they had. And for the little things that they did, you know, my, I had a friend, her favorite, her favorite rule was that the monks could not spit cherry pits at the nuns. <laughs> when they were eating. Wow, that's a drag. And now, you read these rules and you immediately know that the Buddha had a bunch of kids. Because after all the wise men came to him, and then after all the people that had a lot of power came to him, then he had the kids. So they have all these rules about good manners. And when you break a good manner rule, all you have to do is realize that you broke the rule. And think to yourself, shouldn't do that again. I goofed. I went too far. You know? And then you have to, then you adjust it. And, uh, but if you don't adjust it, then you're, you're standing in the need. And the ceremony we did today which has been changed a little bit so that you would actually come on this Sunday. Because back when I used to do this ceremony, it was 108 bows, and everybody would get hot and sweaty and wet, all that sort of stuff. And then people, I remember one time somebody showed up here and they walked in and they said, oh God, it's that day. <laughs> And they knew they couldn't turn around and leave because I'd seen them. <laughs> and I thought, well, okay, we, that, we, can't, we can't do that ceremony anymore. Uh, so we, we modified it so that we don't have to do so many bows. And, and I took a, a poem written by a Vietnamese monk and we got it translated and used it. So the Vietnamese would not recognize what we're doing. They'd recognize we're doing a bunch of bows and we're chanting. They'd go, oh, that's good. But they wouldn't recognize that we were reaffirming the precepts. So all of these rules just came about as time passed, and it passed, and it passed. And, and, but there were a number of rules. Believe it or not, it's a grave offense to give the impression of doing wrong. It's a more grave offense to give the impression of doing wrong than it is to do the wrong. And this is in a number of places. And think about that one. Why is it a worse offense to give the impression of doing wrong than actually doing the wrong? Why are you thinking about that? One of the, one of the rules that's in, in the, the rules is not to speak harshly to another monk. So I apologize to that other monk because I spoke harshly to her. And I thank Sandy for reminding me. The reason why it's a worse offense to give the impression is you're not paying attention. And Zen is looked at as something that started in China. And I don't think it started in China. I think it started the day the Buddha turned to a disciple and said, pay attention. Because that's all we're about, is paying attention. Now we get into the meditation hall, and we sit in there, and we pay attention, at first to ourselves, and we discover that we're totally out of control, Right? 
because we just can't get that mind to quiet down. And then we start understanding about frustration. And some people actually get upset because they just can't get that mind to settle down. But eventually we learn that if we stop encouraging the mind, because that's all we're doing when we try to analyze it. Somebody asked, I think it was Thursday, they said, so if you start a thought, yeah, it was Thursday. We had a couple here that I knew was not going to be here today, but they said they were going to. But a real sweet couple from up at Big Bear. And um, the fellow is trying to meditate every day. And he said, you know, if you have a thought start, if you get this thought going, is it okay to just finish the thought? <laughs> I went, no, no. I said, be, and he said, well, why? And I said, because I could, I could run cartoons for hours when I was a kid. I said, no, you can't finish the thought. You just need to let go of it. You just need to exhale and let go of it. Because you're always talking to yourself. Stuff's always coming up. You can always find a reason. I mean, if you make that, well, then you've got to figure out what you got to get to the grocery store when you leave the temple. And, and, you know, and if, if you're, you've got that figured out, then you can figure out what your chores should be for tomorrow. I mean, I wake up now in the morning, and I'm already doing what I need to do that day. I'm already planning it out. The only problem is that at my age, sometimes I forget what my plans were. But <laughs> I, I don't have any control over that. So I said, no, no, you just need to let go of that. You just need to let go of that. And in the meditation hall, because it's so structured and it's so quiet, we can start encountering the universe. Now, I know the universe is out here. We're in it right here. And we go outside and the wind's blowing and it, it, we got a 50% chance of rain today. Did you see that, Rob? Yeah. So I picked up a lot of stuff this morning running around going, 50% chance of rain. Didn't look like rain, but it sounds like something's coming in right now. And, um, and I lost my thought, which is pretty good. But the universe is everywhere. The problem is we don't connect with the universe. We see it as something other than. It's always other than. It's the same reason why we can think bad thoughts about people for no reason at all. Because they're other. Everything's an other. And yet, science, National Geographic has a great issue on the war against science. And it's talking about, you know, it, it, it's amazing. Uh, I, I'm assuming I have great respect because I've belonged to the National Geographic Society since 1971. I have great respect for the things they say, but they said that 50% of Americans don't believe in evolution. And I'm thinking, really? At this day and age, people don't see how all these, that I guess so. And there's, all, and there's still people that believe that we didn't land on the moon. You know, that, that, that's in the article, so you can read the article. But, uh, There are people that think we're not connected. The Hindus believe that. They believe they're separated from God. The Christians believe that because God lives way over there. And we're here. And when we die, if we've been really, really lucky, because it has nothing to do with being good, because grace is about being lucky, we get to go look. Because we're always separate. There's this notion. I see people cowering in a cave with a small fire, and they feel so separated from the universe. And the one distinctive thing about this teaching that the Buddha had was that we're not separate. That's the illusion, is that we are. The illusion is that somebody's better than us. The illusion is that we're better than somebody. All of these things are manufactured in our minds this powerful little machine we have that sets us apart from everybody else. And when we sit in the Zendo, the easiest place in the whole world, I used to have a friend that say, you become a monk because it's easy. People go, what? 
said, no, you become a monk because it's easy. You know, you don't have to make any excuse why you need to go meditate. It's what monks do. And we start to see that everything's artificial. The separations we have is artificial. Talking about the song of the day and the word family came up. The entire universe is a family. Zen masters have known since the beginning of that school, when they gave it a separate name, the Buddha knew it, but when they gave it a separate name in China, the Zen masters started teaching people that rocks could become enlightened. Absolutely absurd. Except it's true. There's only two forms in the universe. Matter and energy, right? Everybody agree on that? And one's just another form of the other. So everything is the same. So if I can become enlightened, that tree's already enlightened out there. Anything that can live with the abuse I put that tree through has to be enlightened. So that enlightenment nature is within everything. It's simply getting out of our own way to see that it's there.